I'm Eli Nyberger. I'm a Associate Director of IT and Production at the Ann Arbor District Library. We're here at uh, AADL's boardroom. I've got our attendees of Library Camp uh, sitting around here. Let's give it up for Library Camp. Hooray, very exciting. All right, so I just want to talk for just a minute here, and I'll go ahead and force uh, full screen. Um, what will libraries expect in this century, and how might we conduct a business model, an economic model, that might allow us to stay in the content game? Uh, because as we are kind of all noticing, our place in the content industry is a little bit in question right now at this moment. So first, let's look at a couple different axes and try to do some kind of traditional scenario planning. You guys may have seen the, uh, you know, the four window pane scenario planning kind of thing before, but it's really helpful for finding commonalities across multiple scenarios and deciding how best to act. So let's look first at an axis, and I apologize, my slides went through a PowerPoint error and they didn't come out so pretty, so just deal with it. Uh, on the left edge here is a closed market, on the right edge is an open market. So you can look at that as a continuum of different types of markets. Way over on the left is a closed market are things like eBrary and Overdrive where they are controlling who's in the access. Uh, Kindle Store is slightly more open than that. App Store is just a little bit more open than that, although with, uh, with unlimited or final say coming up uh, people who run the store. Android market a little bit more open. Big box retailers it's kind of like an open market but not quite. Then you've got things that are getting a lot more open, like flea markets, garage sales, eBay, and then finally the web. The web is kind of like the ultimate open market. Anyone can put anything up there just for distribution, or there's numerous ways to receive uh, revenue from it. At the same time, whoops. At the same time, you have this crappily formatted slide about what happens to the publishing industry. Does it thrive or does it die back here in this century? And there's lots of different steps that that could take. Uh, you could, they could be really great. They could do okay. It could kind of stay still. They could hang on with their fingernails. They could really take a beating or they could really die back. Um, as those of you who might have seen my Libraries Are Screwed talk, many of the formats that became outmoded collapsed to 1% of their market size by the time it was all over. It happened to candles, it happened to vinyl, it's happening to newspapers, will it happen to print? And if so, what do libraries look like with a print publishing industry that's 1% of the size that it currently is? So, whoops. So let's make a matrix here. On, we have the top column is where published, the top row is where publishing thrives, the bottom row is where publishing dies back, the left row is, or, I'm sorry, the left column is closed markets, the right column are open markets. So let's look at what each one of these things might work. And again, sorry for the formatting. Um, if publishing thrives and closed markets become the standard, you have what you might call a DRM dystopia. Prices will stay high because the publishers are in complete control. They can the price points essentially unilaterally. You'll have tons of professional output, just like what we've got now. There's so many people writing books professionally right now. But you know that it's going to be DRM everywhere. Everything's going to be protected, encrypted, involved with tokens, and it's going to be very difficult to get things onto different devices. And it's also going to lead to device exclusivity fights, which means uh, the people who own devices and device stores are going to be fighting to get exclusive content on their store, which means, you know, James Patterson might say, sign a deal, say he's Kindle only, and that would be then Barnes & Noble will have to go get someone who's Nook only, all that kind of stuff. For libraries, we're going to be continue to only get intermediated, intermediated pub deals, meaning someone gets into these markets and reselling this content back to us, which means we take what we can get. We're not in the driver's seat, and we can't really do anything other than what's available to us by when platforms choose to allow us in, if at all. So let's look at this is uh, if publishing dies back but closed markets triumph, that to me the text got a little bumped up, platform wars is what you might call that. You'll see app store prices because in the absence of a, of a Times Square publishing industry, the 99 cent bit of e-content is going to flourish because that's a very attractive price point and those who can set their price point to 99 cents are finding that they're making more money and not less. You'll have a huge quality range, just like you do on the App Store. In the uh, App Store, there's some really great breakout hits. There's also tons and tons of worthless garbage. Because when you have a closed market, it doesn't mean that everything, in, everything inside the closed market is great. This is what you might call DRM triumph, where DRM completely kills off the traditional publishing industry and leaves in its wake a closed market controlled by the hardware manufacturers. It's a very different model, perhaps closest to the way that Nintendo did this in the mid-80s when they controlled the cartridge industry and they had to approve individual pieces of content to try to avoid sacrificing their industry the way that Atari did in the late, early 80s. In this situation, there are simply no more deals available for libraries. The, uh, you know, Amazon is not going to sell to us. They made that abundantly clear with their latest move, which shows that they will make themselves as an endpoint to overdrive. That is not Kindle for libraries. That is 
overdrive for Kindle. And we need to keep in mind that that's not helping us with the economics of the issue. It's, it's, if anything, it's going to make it worse because all these, all these Kindle owners who are out there are going to say, hey, now I can get Kindle books on my library. And they go to overdrive, and the hold queues just get longer and longer and longer. So the only way that, libs, that libraries can survive in that situation is to find a completely new value proposition, a completely new way to provide value to our communities. Whoops. Did that again. All right, so neo-renaissance is what you might call it if publishing thrives and open markets thrive. All of a sudden, there's all kinds of different ways that you can get everything, which means the relentless downward price pressure of the internet is going to push everything down. Low price points, lots of pro output because so many people are able to make a living as a writer without in the presence of a big publishing industry selling on open markets. Devices then don't matter. You're selling platform independent files that can work on all kinds of different things because you can buy it anywhere you want. You could buy an ebook from a pub, from an author's own site. Uh, you'll have to see deals with all kinds of different publishers and basically this is kind of where we're at now where libraries will be buying and distributing content on open markets. Open markets by default mean no DRM. So that means in the absence of DRM that if a library wants to purchase some content, they just need to make a deal with someone who's selling it, and then they can put it on their website and distribute it freely. Um, if you have a publishing dieback and open market, you might call that a free culture society, which is kind of already the way that the web is, especially when it comes to open source software which means that free is the dominant price point. It's not the only price point, but free is the dominant price point, and the people who produce content make their money through other routes, like selling mugs or t-shirts or personal appearances or going on tour or uh, elaborately hand-stitched leather-bound volumes, limited editions, all that kind of stuff. There's no DRM, no access barrier, devices don't matter. It, at the same time, though, is death of the publisher deal, because there won't be any publishers left re-aggregating and selling uh, lots of different authors that make it easy for libraries to do business with it. But still, libraries have the opportunity to collect stuff in the free culture society, store it on their servers, and make sure it has a permanent home. One of the things we were talking about here at ArtCamp earlier is the, uh, the new role of libraries to actually archive and store content that is born digitally, whether it's produced by our municipalities or produced by members of our community, all kinds of different options here. So let's look at each one of these in a little bit more detail. So what happens if libraries wind themselves in a DRM dystopia? We take what we can get, which means few, if, few if suppliers, sometimes only one supplier. We have no power to make deals. We're paying and getting less. Boy, do we ever know that now as we're trying to deal with the options that are available to us. And we try to find supplemental value or alternate revenue streams to be a part of this, OK? Now let's look at the platform wars. We need to find a new way because the platforms would be uninterested in, in doing business with libraries. Essentially, there will be bestsellers in this scenario that libraries are not allowed to purchase and distribute. That means that libraries, the only way that we can move forward is to focus on either the space itself as a community center or as creation of new content that wouldn't have made economic sense, storing local history, and building the infrastructure to, uh, to uh, provide these sorts of collections for our community. What if the neo-renaissance happens? Libraries have the opportunity to buy and distribute from many different suppliers. They're very complex because there'll be so many different sources of content in an open market. You don't need to deal with it. And the libraries would need to have a storage and distribution infrastructure to keep all this stuff. And in a free culture society, there's endless suppliers. Every schmuck who ever wanted to write a book is now a supplier. And maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, who knows? But if your patrons are asking for it, maybe we ought to have a copy of it. In the same state, libs would need a storage and distribution infrastructure. And you notice that in three of these four scenarios, in a very messy slide, three of these four scenarios, what libraries need are storage and distribution infrastructure which means unless we wind ourselves in DRM dystopia, which is, of course, the way that things look like they're going at the moment, all three of those other situations are going to require libraries having local storage and distribution infrastructure because that's what libraries do. We store stuff and we distribute it. And just because it's going digital doesn't mean that all has to change. So what to do now? We need to build up our storage infrastructure. That's something that we're doing now at Ann Arbor District Library. We have this Magnitude collection we've recently licensed. It was because of the infrastructure investment we'd already made, it was a very quick thing to implement additions of the Magnitude collection to our catalog, and it's no DRM, unlimited download. There's no hold list, there's no waiting, there's no, no book bag, none of that stuff. You log into the catalog, you find an album, and then you click download and it's yours to keep. And this is not something that we're paying for per download. It's a very sustainable, future-oriented service. And it was possible because we had the local storage infrastructure. And we say, hey, it's so expensive. But you know what? We, bought, we brought 16 terabytes on a couple weeks ago, and it cost us under $10,000 to do so. I think it was about six grand for 16 terabytes. It's ridiculous. So what to do later? Make deals with rights holders. And here's why. 
Let's look at the economics of this just real quickly. Assume that a best-selling author makes the $3 royalty for every copy that's sold, which is actually pretty, pretty good. If you average it out, that's, a, that's a, a fortunate thing. Assume an even distribution of purchases across the U.S. and assume a United States population of 300 million people. A blockbuster, and we're looking here as you'll see it, orders of magnitude. A blockbuster book will net the author a nickel per human in the United States, a nickel per citizen. A bestseller will get you a tenth of a nickel per citizen. A breakout hit, which sells 50,000 copies, will get you one hundredth of a nickel per citizen. And a sleeper hit of 5,000 copies, most books don't ever sell 5,000 copies, will get you one one hundredth of a nickel per person in the U.S. So then, building on that from there, if you assume a service area of a 250,000, which is you know, about mid-range, bigger than, bigger than a lot of small towns, but smaller than a few big areas, that means that a blockbuster book will net the author 12,500 people from that service population, $12,500 from that service population of 250,000 people. A best-selling book will get $1,250, a breakout will get $125, and a sleeper will get $1,250. What that means is this is the amount of money that an author is currently making from your service population if it's scaled about this size. So, if we assume a library discounted cost of $20 per copy, the amount of money that a blockbuster author is making from you is the same amount of money that you spend to purchase 625 copies. Now, a library that serves a 250,000 person service area is pretty rarely going to buy 625 copies of something or one copy per every 400 people. But if you go down in order of magnitude to the bestseller as opposed to the blockbuster, you're spending $1,250 to buy 62 copies. It's the same amount of money as that author is netting from your service community. And all you got to do is be able to match $1,250 that they're making, and you can cut the publisher out of the equation. Of course, you've got to have a lot of infrastructure between here and there, but you can see where it's going. With a breakout or a sleeper, which is most, most titles are, those authors are already getting so little revenue from your service area that you've got nowhere to go but up. You could double their take by offering them $250 for permanent downloadable access to your collection. That's only one person for every 40,000 that would read a breakout hit. And going down even further, a sleeper, most libraries would only be spending that much, about 0.6 copies for a $250,000. That's one copy for every 400,000 people. So here's the slide that was supposed to have uh, a picture of James Patterson's swimsuit novel, because there's a big thing that could happen to throw all this into disarray. And that's if James Patterson realizes that he might be able to make more money giving his book away free and having Google ads alongside it, or maybe swimsuit brought to you by the good people at Speedo, would be a completely different way to monetize his work. He could give the entire book away for free online and possibly make more money. You even see authors who are already doing this. So these are all the wild cards and things that are in play here. But at the bottom line is that when we think about the amount of money that libraries spend, it's meaningless to the publishing industry, as some people have calculated on blogs. Only 3 or 4% of publishing industry revenues come from libraries. So they can walk away from us pretty easily. But we could beat the author's return on investment by cutting the publisher out of the equation. And all we need to do is we have the infrastructure and the leap politics to be able to make it happen. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. We're going to keep talking about it here at RN Conference. Thanks for listening, everybody, and good luck. <laughs> oh, you know, while we're waiting for JP to come back on, someone's asking the question, says, uh, Few libraries can afford this structure, why not share? Well, that's absolutely right. We already have an excellent infrastructure in place to share expensive costs, and that's the consortium infrastructure. Uh, and it's basically, we're already using those consortiums to do group purchasing. We need to start using those consortiums to start building infrastructure that we can use to store our own stuff. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you, Eli. You, you all can hear me. All right, well, thanks so much for everyone for coming. Um, everybody killed it uh, on those talks, man. That was awesome. That was uh, really exciting, inspiring stuff. So um, I just encourage you all uh, to keep the conversation going. Lib Uncon all day, hashtag Lib Uncon on Twitter. And if you'd like, we can keep this library unconference going on Twitter from now till forever. Uh, if you want to just keep that live uncon box open in your tweet deck or whatever you use. Thanks for everyone for coming. Thanks again for Learn RT for sponsoring. Thanks again to Darlena for um, setting this all up. And I will see you guys hopefully soon. ALA, I'll see my New Jersey people tonight. All right, talk to you later. <laughs>